This will be a brief overview of classification and diversity of life. When talking about the classification of living things, scientists use the science of systematics to show how the biodiversity of all living things is organized and classified. Systematics also has branches of taxonomy and phylogeny to help further explain how all living things are classified. So let's start with talking about systematics. Systematics is a scientific field. Lots of scientists use it. Since we're in biology, we're going to talk about biologists, how they use it to organize and classify organisms. An underlying theme of biology is evolution. The way in which organisms are organized and classified is based on their evolutionary relationships. This allows us to look at the diversity of life in an orderly manner. Because science uses data to show evidence, systematics specifically also uses data. So let me talk about all the different kinds of data that is used. Phenotypes. How something looks. Its behaviors. How it interacts with other organisms how that organism tries to survive. All of these things are phenotypes. In addition, phenotypes may describe the internal physiology of an organism. Does it have one heart? Does it have a simple heart with two chambers? Does it have a three-chambered heart, a four-chambered heart? So things like that. Fossil records are also used to infer the age of an organism in comparison to other organisms. Most useful now, though, to the field of systematics are modern methods of biochemistry to look at simple things like gene sequences or an amino acid sequence of a protein. They might use immunology to look at antibody similarities as well as the interactions of antibodies with their antigens. And if they have all of this data, they might compare whole genomes between organisms. A branch of systematics that uses the internationally recognized language of naming organisms and putting them into hierarchical groups is taxonomy. And we're gonna come back to this. Phylogeny describes an organism's evolutionary history and the organism's evolutionary relatives based out of shared ancestries. One of the tools that phylogeny uses are phylogenetic trees. And so you can see up here in the corner of the slides that there are little trees and what these branches between the trees show is they show the evolutionary relationships among organisms. So the more branches that you share with another organism, the more closely related you are evolutionarily. And again, we're going to come back to this. So a little bit about evolutionary relationships. One of the ways that we use to talk about how organisms are classified is into what are called clades. A clade is just a fancy way of saying a group. And these groups are based on the evolutionary history of organisms. The more groups that two organisms share, the more closely evolutionarily related they are. So let's take a step back. Let's go back to taxonomy for a minute. In taxonomy, the Linnaean system is used. It was invented by Carl Linnaeus. He studied things like botany and zoology and even medicine. What this language does hierarchically is it shows how organisms are related based on words or language. His system starts with a point of origin, and these are the largest groups or clades, which are called the domains. All organisms fit into one of three inclusive domains. And what I mean by inclusive is that each domain includes a lot of organisms. These three domains are archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. 
that way we can go down to things that are more specific. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about, well, why do we use things like systematics? All right, so let's say that you are going to go shopping for your favorite toothpaste. You love Tom's Organic Peppermint Toothpaste, and you're gonna go over to Target, and when you walk in the door, you kinda instinctually know where to go. Mm, not really, I mean, maybe you've learned over time where to go, but Target makes it really easy for you because hanging up high, from the ceiling, there are signs that say the different departments like pharmacy, personal care, kitchen, bath, clothing, electronics, grocery, seasonal. So you're going to head over to the personal care section. And on the ends of aisles, there are titles describing what is found in each aisle. Makeup, hair care, body lotion, deodorant, and dental hygiene. You're going to go down that dental hygiene aisle. And there are different sections, toothbrushes, floss, toothpaste. In the toothpaste section... There will be divisions of adult and children, sensitivity, and natural. In the natural section, you see different kinds. In the Tom section, you can find your specific kind of toothpaste. This is a much better system than just putting random items on shelves, depending on when the cases of these items arrive at the store. Thankfully, we have organization, and typically everything in life is pretty well organized because that's the way that we respond to everything in the world. All right, so at the beginning of life, there is this hypothetical common ancestor, right? And from that common ancestor, scientists start to divide organisms into these three points of origin, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya domains. Within each domain, there's a next category, and those categories can go down from domain, then kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. The last group, the genus and the species, get into a little more important information. So again, I want to go over those major clades that domains can have. And so going from our broadest... Most inclusive, meaning includes the most organisms, is the domain, and then you might have within a domain the kingdom, a phylum, a class, an order, a family, a genus, and a species. All right. Here you see one of my very favorite organisms, Chilinius undulatus. This is a fish who lives in the Indo-Pacific region of the world around coral reefs. They eat marine invertebrates and also they can eat some poisonous prey and not get sick. This is the super male in the population. There's typically one super male in a population of these fish. The rest of the fish are smaller in size and drab in color. You can see the super males pretty big. They can grow up to about seven feet and they are brightly colored blue and green and have really neat patterns on them. What's super interesting about this fish is that they are protogynous hermaphrodites. What that means is this super male started out life as a female and then changed into a male. So how the heck does that happen? Well, when this super male dies, it is thought that they give off some kind of a pheromone or chemical message. And that allows one of the females to receive that message and start to change from a mature female into a mature male. Now, let's say that you and I, we go on a scuba diving trip together and we see one of these. And when we come up, we're super excited to talk about it. And so when we get up there, I say, oh, I saw a humphead wrasse. And you say, I saw a Napoleon wrasse. And someone else says, I saw an Iposipus. And another person says, I saw a double-headed Maori wrasse. Well, 
we're all talking about the same thing, but how do we know that? We know that because there is the scientific name. And that goes by the binomial system of nomenclature. It means a two name system of naming organisms. So Carol Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus, Carlos Linnaeus, he goes by a lot of different names too. Also Carl von Linné, he created the system of naming, maybe because he had a lot of names too. And this two system of naming goes down to our two most specific clades, the genus and species groups. And every species has one specific name, the genus followed by the species. So let's go back to my friend here, Chilinius undulatus. Chilinius is the genus name and undulatus is the species name. So let's look at a few other species. Chilinia mitis, Calisibus malis, Cardinalis cardinalis, and Escherichia coli. The common names, or some of the common names for these are that when we're talking about Chilinia mitis, that's the green sea turtle. Calisibus malic is the red TT monkey. Cardinalis cardinalis is the red cardinal. And E. coli is Escherichia coli. So I want you to take a look at these and notice a couple things about these scientific names here. One is that you can see with all of them, the genus name, the first letter is capitalized with the species name, it is not capitalized. You can see that that second word or the species name is in lowercase. The other thing that I'd like you to notice is that all of these names, they are in italics. So when you're typing, they're in italics. So again, a little review. The genus name of a species is capitalized. The species name or the second word is not. You would in typing, put all of these in italics, or let's say that we're on the boat and you're making a list by hand of what you saw. If you were writing the genus and species names, you would underline them by hand. Now let's talk a bit about biodiversity. The term biodiversity has that word B-I-O in it. And B-I-O, when we're talking about that, it means living things. And so the term biodiversity means the diversity of all living things. But it's not only the sheer number of total species within an ecosystem, but it is also the complexity of the interactions among them. Because if you think about any species, like us, for example, we can't exist without the help of other species. Alone, we need plants, algae, cyanobacteria, that photosynthesize to provide us with oxygen. And we also need plants to provide us with food or to provide things that we eat with food. The estimated amount of biodiversity, well, there's about seven to 10,000 new species discovered and named every year. So that continues to increase we're mostly talking about insects from the tropical rainforest. We also have uh, the estimation of biodiversity can change a lot because species go extinct as well. In terms of how many species are out there, well, there's about 1.5 million species identified, but scientists have a range of what they actually think exists, and it could be anywhere from 7 million to as much as 100 million, I'm sorry, 100,000 million identified biodiversity. Of all the species identified thus far, only about 5% are prokaryotes and protists. So when we're talking about prokaryotes, which we haven't defined this term yet, but these are single celled organisms and they really make up the majority of organisms on the earth. Now, they haven't been identified all yet, 
but we'll talk about that in a minute. 22% are plants and fungi, and the rest are animals. So why animals? If prokaryotes are the most on the earth, but the least amount identified, why are animals the most that are identified? Well, there's a few things about animals. So let's think about your favorite organism. Visualize it. Is it a bacterium? I'm guessing it's probably either a colorful, beautiful flower or some kind of cool plant, or most likely it's probably some animal and it's really, really cute. And so because of human nature, we like animals. So we try as scientists to identify animals more than prokaryotes. If you were to go out into the rainforest, it's a lot easier to identify plants, maybe some fungi, but animals like insects, for example. If you were going to start to try and identify prokaryotes, you would have to bring a variety of scientific materials with you to collect them, plate them out, incubate them. Then you would have to go through a series of dyes and looking at slides. And so that takes a lot more labor to identify those. So hopefully you can see why animals are more identified than any other organisms. Now, we're gonna go back here to the idea of phylogeny and looking at the evolutionary relationships among organisms based on a tree structure. So evolutionary relationships, the branches of the clades, you can see there's lots of branches on these, this or this tree, and there's lots of branches off the tree. So right here at the bottom would be our common ancestor, the CA or common ancestor would exist here. And then we have three branches to show the different domains that from this common ancestry, you have the bacterial domain, the archaea domain, and the eukarya domain. And then with every branch or every V shape, what you see in the V here, that means that, and I've got a little arrow pointing every V, that there is a common ancestor. So again, every branch or V has a common ancestor between two branches of organisms. And I don't have them all pointed out, but if we look at the Eukara branch, for example, you can see that animals are more closely related to fungi than they are to plants or to the protists here. So again, just showing you that animals are more closely related to fungi because they share this branching area in here. Of the three domains, the bacteria and the archaea share a common ancestor. And then we can also see that from the archaea, you have a common ancestor between the archaea and the eukarya here. So let's talk a little bit about the three domain system of classification. I know I've mentioned it before, but the three domains are the archaea or archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya or the eukarya. So with these three domains, two of them contain prokaryotic cells. The term prokaryotic means that these cells have no nucleus. The term pro here means to evolve before. So they evolved before and karyotic, this term karyotic here means nucleus. So eukaryotic, again, you've got this karyotic thing here. It means nucleus and you means true. So these organisms have a true nucleus and these organisms evolved before the nucleus evolved. 
the only domain that has kingdoms right now is the Eukara domain. And there are the kingdoms, so kingdoms protista, and there's a bunch of domains there. There is the kingdom fungi, the kingdom plantae, and the kingdom animalia. With advances in biochemistry or molecular genetics, we will see soon coming with much research to be done, there's going to be domains under archaea and bacteria. So it doesn't mean that they don't have them, they just haven't been named yet. But we'll see that probably in our lifetime. Great career path to go into. So again, just to make clear that whatever you see here on a phylogenetic tree, where you have a V shape, what that V shape means is there is a common ancestor. And so the bacteria and the archaea, they have a common ancestor or they share a common ancestor. And when we take a look at the archaea and the eukara, they share a common ancestor here. Now, when we take a look at the named kingdoms of the eukara, what you will see is that animals and fungi, they share a common ancestor at that V point there. And when we take a look at the fungi and plants, they share a common ancestor here. And then we have our various groups of protists and one of our protist groups will share a common ancestor with plants being here. And this just gives you an idea of the Eukara and how much work has been done on them. And we have a lot of branches. And then again, with the branches, you have common ancestors amongst the branches. Wherever you see a branch off, you have common ancestry. So a tiny, tiny, tiny bit about the Eukara. Again, the name Eukara, U means true. And the cara means nucleus. Sometimes people call this eukarya or eukara. All these cells have a nucleus. The term eukaryote is a noun. Eukaryotic is an adjective. So you might say a eukaryotic cell or you might say a eukaryote. And here are all of the kingdoms, the protista groups or kingdoms, the fungi, the plantae, and the animalia. And here's just another way to view the eukara. We're going to get into the rest of these in great detail as we go along. So we will be exploring the archaea or archaea group, the bacteria group, and the eukara or eukarya groups.